my panelists can see clearly where some names are much easier for me to pronounce than others. <laughs> and Ramses Cleland, um, Yana's ambassador to Switzerland. So thank you all very much for joining us. I will give first the floor to the president. Thank you very much, madam, and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Welcome the opportunity to say a few words about Ghana and what's going on in our country. This is the first time I've ever been to these gatherings in Davos. And, um, I, well, for many years I was a little bit reluctant to come here. I wasn't quite sure what I would meet. But um, I've been impressed by one thing. That is the efficiency that this gathering presents for meeting people that you would want to talk to. I think the idea of bringing so many people together in one space, politicians, business people, people from academia, the NGO community, individuals, um, it pre presents a very good uh, uh, platform for this, I don't know what the word I suppose is networking. And to that extent, I found it very efficient and, and helpful. It's also been quite educative because you go to several of the panels and the quality of the discourse of the people who are speaking, their knowledge on the subjects about which they're speaking uh, is very educative. And uh, so I mean, on both these grounds, I've really enjoyed my visit here. The climate, of course, is not to my taste. <laughs> I am a, a man of the forests of West Africa. I believe in the hot, humid climate. And this is the exact opposite. But uh, you have to make a balance in all of these things. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying very much my first, my, my first uh, impressions and visit to Davos. I have three things that I want to say about today, contemporary Ghana. First, the very determined efforts we're making to build a viable, durable democracy in Ghana. I think that's extremely important, especially when you look back on our history. We were the first to get independence in sub-Saharan Africa. I think that story is well known to many people who follow African history. But unfortunately, the attainment of independence didn't usher us into good governance systems. It began with dictatorship in the First Republic, and then a series of military coups and military interventions in our national life, which meant that in a very short space of time, we had gone, we had gone through three republics. The end result of it was a consensus that built up in Ghana in the late 80s and early 90s, that really the multi-party democratic system was the most uh, uh, beneficial uh, system of government for us. And the Fourth Republic that was inaugurated on the 7th of January 1993 has indeed proved to be the most enduring of the four republics of our history. The 26 now get heading on for 27 years of the Fourth Republic has witnessed three different changes of government through the ballot box. In itself, certainly as far as our history is concerned, um, very much uh, against the thrust of, of, our, of, of, of our past. And even within the African context, it's unusual that a country could go through these experiences and not witness any significant uh, disturbances or destabilization of the body politic. There are many people who for years used to say that democratic governance would lead to either breakdown of, of the states into ethnic rivalries or in, institute uh, instability in its functioning. That has not been the Ghanaian experience. The Ghanaian experience has been the contrary. The democratic institutions of Ghana have proved to be unifying institutions of our state. The, the constitution has proved to be a unifying factor 
in the development of our country and the willingness of the, both the political class and the ordinary or, and the people of Ghana to accept the basic tenets of democratic accountability has also meant that it has contributed to the stability of our country. And that is why today Ghana is seen as uh, one of the most stable, not seen as, is one of the most stable, peaceful countries on the continent. I think a great deal of it is due to the, to the acceptance and the awareness of the Ghanaian people that democracy could be a very uh, positive form of governance for them. The second, of course, is the efforts we're making to build a strong market economy. Over the period of the, the, the Fourth Republic, most of the indices of human development have significantly improved when you compare them over the period of military and non-democratic rule. But that's the overall picture. But within it, too, we've had some highs and lows. I came into office at a time when the Ghanaian economy was in considerable disarray. Even though we, had, we were under an IMF program, many of the fundamental uh, indices of economic well-being were not present. And high rates of inflation, high indebtedness, uh, very sluggish growth, negative growth in agriculture, bare growth in industry. And that was a background. In fact, that is really, those are the circumstances that brought me into office as president of Ghana. So the three years of our mandate have been spent, first of all, in trying to restore stability to the management of our economy. Cutting down on the deficit, bringing down inflation. The deficit we inherited at on the 7th of January 2017 was 9.3%. Today is 4.5%. Inflation was at 15.4% when we came into office. It's today 7.9%. We have, for the first time, a positive trade balance. The reserves in the nation, the, the, the national reserves, uh, 2.5 months import cover in 2017 has grown to 4.5 in, in the period of these three years. And generally, the, and the growth, of course, has gone from 3.6% to an average of 7% over these last three years. So you see an economy that in some ways has, has reversed the decline and is now on an upward trajectory. It has also meant that these improving uh, macroeconomic indices that we have now, we're now touted as the country that receives the largest amount of foreign direct investment in the ECOWAS and West African region. For me, the most important aspect of it has been the discipline that has been restored to the management of our public finances. We've gone so far ahead as also, because it is that absence of discipline that has kept us having to resort to the IMF for bailouts, which we have done too many times in our national life. I think that if we are able to maintain the discipline that is required of us, we would have no need, and we could then proceed to, divide, to design our own uh, pattern path for economic growth and development. We've gone so far as to pass a fiscal responsibility law, which is pegged and the acceptable fiscal deficit at 5% annually, and uh, with penalties that are imposed against the government if we go past the 5% limit. We are determined to make the law talk. This year's budget, which is the first full budget that has been passed in the post-IMF era, has been very resolute 
in accepting the discipline of the fiscal responsibility law and aspect of deficit this year, 4.5%. There were many cynical skeptics who said that it being election year, we're bound to loosen the purse strings and, 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 and do the spending that would enable us to buy the election. We've resisted that because we take the view that assuming you were to win and the economy is in disarray, that means that all the work that we did would have to be redone and that it was better for us to maintain the discipline and accept that the Ghanaian people have a very clear understanding of what is required to be done for us to have the progress that we need to make. So that's the second phenomenon about the, uh, the Ghana of today, which I we think is important. The efforts of economic recovery and the data that is out there show clearly that uh, that has been the case. The Ghana Living Standards Survey tells us that unemployment in Ghana, which stood at 11.5% in 2015, is now 7.9% in 2019. So that these economic data are not just data in themselves, but they have an actual impact on the lives of people. The one, I think, also outstanding development that has taken place in the period is the revival of Ghanaian agriculture. When we came into office, we were importing even basic foodstuffs from our neighbors, plantain, tomatoes, we're coming in from Burkina Faso, from Côte d'Ivoire. Today, as a result of the program that we put in place in 2017, which we call the Program for Planting for Food and Jobs, we've reversed these, these, the, 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 this situation. And now we are now net exporters of foodstuffs again. We've had two bumper harvests in Ghana. And in the last two years, we have stopped importing maize. We have cut down on our import of rice. The prices of foodstuffs in Ghana are the lowest that we've had in nearly two decades. And all of this testified to the fact that the program for food and uh, planting for food and jobs, which is essentially a program for uh, government support for uh, Ghanaian agriculture, essentially smallholder agriculture. Our, agricultural system is not hinged on huge plantations. It's hinged on small family-owned agricultural enterprises. Uh, the, the inputs that are coming from government in terms of fertilizer subsidy, insecticides thing, uh, making available extension ser uh, services to be able to assist the farmers is a bundle of measures that have been taken, that have been put in place that has made this dramatic increase in it. Agriculture was growing at negative levels, is today growing at 7.6, 7.7%. And as I say, we are now net exporters of foodstuffs to our neighbors. We have a program also which we, have called, which we call the One District, One Factory Policy. Basically a program of rural industrialization that has as its object creating employment in the rural communities, at tackling the phenomenon of rural urban migration, ensuring that there are worthwhile jobs for young people within their rural settings, and of course, helping in the transformation of the Ghanaian economy. Essentially, the economy of Ghana, like the economies of many countries on the continent of Africa, have been raw material producing and exporting economies. And they are the reasons why growth in Africa has been sluggish, has led to the spillover of young, lots of young Africans trying to flee the continent. And that the solution meant required the industrialization of the continent and of our own country and taking the steps that will lead to the structural transformation. The measures that we have put in place for rural industrialization um, are also 
part of those measures of recovery. So I'd say that the economic um, program that has been put in place by the government since we came into office has been substantially successful. They've addressed the key uh, phenomena that needed to be addressed, the rate of growth of the economy, the expansion of employment, um, much, much stronger economic activity. And also enabled us to pay, to pay for one of the most important uh, social intervention initiatives that any government in Ghana has undertaken. When I came into office, the five years before, on an average, 100,000 young Ghanaians dropped out of the school system at the level of junior high school. Junior high school basically was the education that would take you to the age of 15. How, how, what are its equivalents here? But that is the, the average age of people at junior high school, 14 to 15. And because of, because of money uh, considerations, you had over 100,000 young people who even though they had the qualifications to go further up the educational, couldn't go to it because their parents couldn't afford to pay. And I campaigned on the need for us to get that out of our national uh, uh, presence. And that the state should take on the burden of providing uh, free education at, this, at the senior high school level. The victory meant that that had to be done. And in fact, we have seen some dramatic figures that in, the, in the educational space in, our, in the country. Roughly, there were about 800,000 people within the edu secondary educational system when I took office. In the three years of the application of the free senior high school policy, we now have 1.2 million Ghana young Ghanaians within the secondary school system which means quite clearly that the 100,000 a year dropout rate that we had before I came has now been addressed, and those 100,000 are finding their place in school. It has meant some challenges in terms of infrastructure, necessarily, because the infrastructure that was in place um, uh, had now to accommodate a much greater population. But then came the question, uh, would you have to build a house before you get people to come and live in it? Or do you get people to come and live in it and build a house as you go along? We took the view that if you're going to wait for everything to be right, you never get anything done, that it was better to start. And in the process, of course, we're now vigorously addressing the infrastructural deficit that there is in our secondary school system. On that message of action, I'm just going to be mindful of everyone's uh, time, and um, especially since it's so precious here at Davos, I'm going to open up the floor to see if there are any questions before I take any additional comments from the panelists. If you have a question, please raise your hand and state your name and uh, media outlet. Mr. President, my name is Diabo Sito from uh, South African Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, you've outlined envious plans um, uh, and, and uh, uh, what Ghana is doing and how the economy and how well it's doing, which is quite um, envious. We are quite envious as other African countries that we'd love to see economic growth at those levels. I'm curious, though, to find out about um, the country's climate change plans. What is in the pipeline? What are you actively doing? I know that there was um, a point where you are trying to introduce um, climate education, I believe, in schools. How is, is that coming along? And what is the message that you're communicating to um, international community here about um, uh, the climate? And the most fundamental thing that we have done is to fuse the 17 SDGs, including their teachings on climate change, and the preservation of our ocean into our national budget. For two years running, we've, our national budgets have reflected our commitment to the implementation of the SDGs. 
So all through the governmental system, right from the local to the national level, those commitments form part of the agenda of government. And they include, of course, the efforts of climate change. We have also taken on a big task of reafforestation, the deforestation that has taken place over the years past, of course, has led to great problems with the climate. And we have also instituted a vigorous program of combating illegal mining in the country so that we can have responsible mining in, in Ghana, which once again would have a very big impact on our climate uh, development. But it's, uh, it's a matter of concern, and, it, and, 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 it's, and like these critical issues, a great deal of it also has to do with what we need to do about education to make sure that people are aware of the consequences of, of, of their actions on the climate. We had a second question in the room. Hi, <clears throat> Omar Ben Yedda from African Business Magazine. I've got a host of questions, but I'll... Uh, a host. Uh, I'm hoping uh, you can no, be no, succinct. No, no, <laughs> but, I, but I'm only going to focus on two. I wanted to speak about the uh, ECHO CFA, also the risk premium of Africa but uh, and, uh, and Ghana and uh, pricing of our assets. But I'll focus on two things. You mentioned uh, durable democracy. So uh, there's a whole debate, and it's been ongoing for 30 or 40 years, what system of, uh, of government should, uh, should we choose on, on, on the continent. But you spoke about the maturity of the, uh, of the Ghanaian people. Did that maturity happen before uh, you, uh, you transitioned to uh, this durable democracy, or did it transition after the, uh, once, once they saw the benefits of, uh, of durable democracy? That's number one. And number two, you spoke about uh, how you, uh, well, your, your set of priorities that you managed to uh, to deal with, but what are what are the headwinds that uh, that you foresee, and therefore the next set of priorities that uh, you and your administration will be focusing your energy on? Thank you. The, the 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 durable democracy. I think what really is the the decision that was made in 1992 was that after everything that we had been through, it would have appeared that we, we had gone through virtually every conceivable type of, of, of uh, governance experiment you can imagine. We began the, the, as, as a one-party state. Uh, we then transitioned to various kinds of military uh, governance. One of them was something they called union government, which meant a permanent military presence in the state with co-opted civilians in it. I mean, all of those, and at the end of the, the, the period, after some 25 years after independence, then the Ghanaian people came to the conclusion that no, really, uh, the, the system of governance that we had, we had known in the pre-colonial era, the leading up to independence, which was essentially the multi-party democratic state, represented the most uh, effective bulwark, once for the, 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 the protection of the rights and liberties of people, and also for efficient governance. So I would say it came out of, the, uh, it came out of our history, it came out of the consciousness of people that this was the best way to go forward. And then our priorities. The priorities continue to be, at the economic level, the, the, the process of transformation of the Ghanaian economy. We're doing so with, against the background of the fourth industrial revolution and what digital uh, technology will have avails us. But also, a major priority has to be going forward the protection of Ghana from the, the, the terrorist and um, outrages and violent extremism that is sweeping through some parts of the Sahel. The, our neighbor, Burkina Faso, is in the turmoil of a life and death struggle against terrorism. Further down, Niger and Mali, um, are also gripped in the struggle with terrorism. Clearly, a stable, growing, functioning Ghana 
has to be in the sight of people who have these um, the ambitions that are fueling the jihadist menace. So the measures that we need to take to make sure that Ghana continues as a stable, uh, peaceful, developing country remain major, major priorities for us. And at the same time, and that was the third matter that I was going to speak about, was the Pan-African agenda of which Ghana is at the center. As you know, we have been given the privilege by our peers on the continent to host the Secretariat of the African Free Trade, Continent, uh, Continental Free Trade Area. The, the agreement that, brought, that has brought the free trade area into effect provides that in July this year, the AFCFTA will be in operation. The Secretariat, which is hosted in Accra, is due to be up and running by March. That is therefore also a major preoccupation of the government, to create the infrastructure, both the hard and soft infrastructure, that would allow us to maximize this new opportunity that has been given, which is really essentially that Ghana becomes a, a hub, a, a trade and investment hub for those who want, therefore, to reach this large market of um, 1.2 billion people that the African uh, free trade area encompasses with, what, two to three trillion collective GDP. So the, these are the key priorities. And within the Pan-African agenda, there's an even larger concept of how we can also build effective bridges with the African diaspora. Our belief is very strongly that the African diaspora, that is our kith and kin in the Americas and in the Caribbean, also represent a large force, potential force, for good, for our development. And therefore, we are making, we're taking those measures to build a strong bridge across the Atlantic and will also bring them into play in our national and continental life. As you know, Ghana has, last year, we initiated what we call the Year of Return, which was a celebration. Well, no, you could actually call it a celebration, but a commemoration of 400 years of slavery. Uh, the first 20 West African slaves uh, was transported to the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1619. And 2019 was the 400th year of that event. And we initiated a year-long program, which we call the Year of Return, to commemorate that fact and also to reinforce our determination that such history will never be visited on the African peoples again. And at the same time, use it as a vehicle for reestablishing and reviving and solidifying our relations with our kith and kin in the Americas. It was a very, very successful project, and it has now led us also to begin to put into place the measures that we look upon as beyond the return, what next? But these are the main priorities of our government in the years going forward, and we think that um, if we are able to successfully confront and deal with these priorities, uh, the end result will be a, a developed, uh, free and prosperous Ghana. And that's our goal. At Outseer, we stop fraud, not your customers. Visit us at stopfraudnotcustomers.com. We'll take one more question, and then we'll close our press conference. Thank you. Judith Kurman, I'm a foreign editor at the Swiss Daily Neue Zwecher Zeitung. I'd like to come back to the question of the security in Sahel region. And I would like to know what neighboring countries, such as Ghana, could do, um, which effects you fear for your country, and how you see the foreign involvement, especially from military engagement, especially from the side of France. Thank you. First of all, what we ourselves can do, and that has always to be critical, uh, we are the authors of the Accra Initiative. 
The Accra Initiative has brought together the intelligence agencies of Benin, Togo, Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso. And now Mali and Niger have been added to the group of people whose intelligence and security chiefs meet on a regular basis in whatever capital they agree on to coordinate their intelligence and information about what is going on in our various countries as far as this terrorist menace is concerned. So that initiative in itself was a proactive decision that was taken, uh, which we were very much involved in making sure that the collaboration and cooperation that we need to have in order to be able effectively to deal with this terrorist menace in West Africa was well established. And it is working well, and it is helping. There's also the willingness. We so far have not got any troops in the, the, the force that is being raised within the G5 Sahelian countries. They've not asked for it, and there's, there's not, there doesn't seem to be any necessity. They themselves have it. But obviously, a major problem for poor countries like Mali, like Niger, all, all of our countries of West Africa is the wherewithal to be able to find the money for the arms in this room. Poor countries are having to spend inordinate amounts of their own budgets fighting this, this battle. And clearly, the assistance of the international community uh, is welcome. Uh, uh, it is in that context that France has stepped forward to offer both military as well as financial support for these G5 countries. I think that in the context of the fight in which we're engaged, because in, in any event, the jihadist uh, threat, the terrorist threat in West Africa, has a large international dimension. All of us are aware that many of those who are orchestrating the the menace are people who have been displaced from from the Middle East, Iraq, etc., who are now through Libya found themselves in in, in, in in the Sahelian region. So there are forces within the international community that also are, are sympathetic to our fight for stability and for freedom. Yes, I think that uh, association is perfectly in order. Thank you, Mr. President, for <coughs> apologies for your vo views and perspective. On that note, I'd like to close the press conference. Well, I'd like thank to say one thing before you do. Okay. <laughs> that is that at the end of it all, there's one thing that you've heard us being repeating, that we are fighting and working for Ghana beyond aid. I think that that is the message that I would like to conclude this press conference with, that we are looking to build a Ghana where we will no longer need aid from the so-called donor community because we will be able to stand on our own feet. And that's, that's the perspective that we're fighting for. Indeed, for an Africa beyond aid, an Africa that is self-reliant, that is standing on its own feet and being able to deal with those problems itself. And one of the things that we would like to do in this process is, I don't know, now that I have become uh, uh, convert to the Davos thing. Is Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm honored to be introducing our keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, you've probably noticed the focus on Sub-Saharan Africa at this year's Concordia event. As part of that, there are several strategic dialogues taking place tomorrow. Uh, on driving sustainable economic development in the region. This keynote fits extremely well into that overall theme. Nana Akufado is the president of Ghana, an office he has held since January of last year. Before I ask him to take the podium, please uh, allow me a few brief words to uh, set the stage. Since the NPP came to power 19 months ago, much has been promised and much has been achieved. As a candidate on the campaign trail back in 2016, the president vowed to change the face of Ghana. 
in his words, to pull the country out of stagnation and backwardness and onto a path of progress and prosperity. Expectations are therefore very high, but the verdict seems to be that the president is delivering, committed to building a country focused on the proper management of its own resources. He has uh, vowed to tackle corruption. He has called for closer trade ties with countries across Africa. And after a year of disciplined uh, economic management, most, if not all, uh, of Ghana's macroeconomic indicators sh are showing positive signs. Meeting with China's president earlier this month, the president said his country is considering issuing a 100-year, $50 billion bond as part of a long-term industrialization plan that aims to wean Ghana off aid. We do not want to remain the beggars of the world, he said uh, in a speech last year in London. We do not want to be dependent on charity. Now, the markets might be a little skeptical that Ghana can pull off such an ambitious fundraising, and critics cry over optimism, but this is the president's vision for a new Ghana, a Ghana beyond aid, something he has said that requires a deliberate, qualitative change in the structure of the economy, the nature of Ghana's infrastructure, and the education of its youth. Uh, one final thing, if you can remain in your seats after the president has finished speaking, uh, he will be receiving an Outstanding Leaders Award on behalf of the U.S. Africa Business Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for his work in promoting trade uh, and investment in Ghana. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency, President Akufado. If you're over 60 in the UK, do not buy a funeral plan until you've watched this video. One company... Ladies and gentlemen, I must at the outset say how delighted and honoured I am to be here this afternoon, to be in the midst of such an excellent gathering of people. On behalf of the people and government of Ghana, I thank the US Chamber of Commerce and its US Africa Business Center warmly for the honor of this award, the outstanding, the 2018 Outstanding Leaders Award. It's good to know that adv advocating for Ghana to opt for partnership with the rest of the world on the basis of trade and investment cooperation, not aid, has its rewards. The Ghanaian people are humbled by the award, and we accept the challenge that it imposes on us and in what the world expects of Ghana. The receipt of this award and the recitation to be read to this effect represents a summary of my focus as Ghana's president since assuming the reins of office some 21 months ago. I have sought not only to strengthen my country's democratic credentials, but also to help create wealth and provide opportunities for its people. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana, like most countries in Africa, is blessed with an abundance of human and natural resources. However, we have been, over the years, been heavily reliant on the production and export of these natural resources in their raw form. We've also not taken deliberate steps to create an educated workforce to spur on the development of our country. Unsurprisingly, we've not been able to bring sufficient progress and prosperity to the mass of Ghanaians. This sad state of affairs has deepened our reliance on aid, charity, and handouts, thereby making us vulnerable to the politics of foreign powers. We've decided to try to buck this trend, as it is the only way we can bring wealth to the Ghanaian people and hold the dynamic of our young men and women 
leaving the country in search of allegedly greener pastures abroad. We want thus to emulate the past of prosperity taken by countries that have become today's success stories, especially those of Asia. That is why my government has fashioned the program of economic transformation hinged on restructuring the institutions of our governance, modernizing our agriculture to enhance its productivity, implementing a clear industrial policy, and rationalizing the financial sector so that it supports growth in agriculture and growth in manufacturing and industry. We are creating a resilient and robust economy and the macroeconomic indices at the halfway point of my term of office are pointing in the right direction, a direction that will be maintained so that we can provide the stability to stimulate investments. At the beginning of my government's mandate, we confronted an economy that was in steep decline, having obtained a growth rate of 3.6% in 2016, the lowest in 22 years. By dint of hard work, and prudent management, GB, GDP growth rate grew to 8.5% in our first year. This year, we expect it to grow at 8.3%, which according to the International Monetary Fund, will make us one of the world's fastest growing economies. Sector after sector, we're making significant advances. We've also taken steps to formalize the Ghanaian economy, and in the process, we aim to establish the most business-friendly economy in Africa to enable the private sector to thrive. Our modest successes in making progress in these areas are being recognized by the global business community that is now eager to engage with Ghana. Recently, our overarching goal to diversify our economy from being an, a producer and exporter of raw materials to dealing with the world on the basis of things we make, received a major boost when two global car giants, Volkswagen of Germany and Sinotruck of Ghana, announced that they will be establishing very soon assembly plants in Ghana with the intention in the medium term of producing these vehicles, their vehicles, in the country. Tech giant Google has also decided to base its African Inter Artificial Intelligence Center in Ghana, which will make it the first in Africa. ExxonMobil has also signed an agreement with the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GMPC, to undertake deep water oil exploration and production. For us, the rapid enhancement of foreign direct investment is an essential ingredient in, release, in realizing our vision of a Ghana beyond aid. That is, building in Ghana a strong, productive economy capable of generating a dignified, prosperous existence for its people and banishing the specter of poverty. Ghana is forging ahead. We want to be a force to reckon with on the continent and in the world. We will develop, we will industrialize, we'll educate our people, and we will add value to our abundant natural resources. So, I urge representatives of Fortune 500 companies present here to look at Ghana and not to ignore her. You can choose to invest through the Ghana Investment Promotion Center or to set up as a company in our free zones enclave. Regardless of where the investment is, government has instituted a number of incentives for the investor, depending on the nature of the activity or the location of the investment. This is to ensure that your investment succeeds. I assure you, that your investments will be safe, in fact, and will be protected by law. I'm confident that through our policies, we can bring greater dignity to the lives of millions of people in Ghana and beyond. It will not be easy. 
We have no illusions whatsoever about the nature of the task that we face. But I know we can rise to the occasion, as we did when we led the continent in the struggle for the liberation of Africa from colonialism and imperialism. The black star is going to shine and shine and shine, and we're going to construct a Ghana beyond aid. I thank the US Chamber of Commerce and its US Africa Business Center once again for this award. I'll do my best not to let the side down. May God bless us all and the peoples of Ghana and the United States of America, and may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Myron Brilliant and Scott Eisner from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. For the U.S. Chamber's Africa Business Center and the U.S. Chamber's American Chamber affiliate in Ghana, thank you all for being here to be a witness of this award. I want to say at the outset what you heard from the President is true. His efforts to reduce poverty, to address economic plight, to increase economic opportunity, uh, his work to grow the economy, which is now running about eight and eight and a half percent since uh, he took office when it was running low threes. The work that he's done to fight corruption, to improve the rule of law, is really a tribute to President Kufu Otto, and we wanted to recognize him with this prestigious award from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It is an award that we don't give lightly, we take seriously, and we do it out of respect to what the President has done in Ghana. So please give him a round of applause. Trustees of the Metropolitan Club, the celebrated president, management committee, and distinguished members of the Metropolitan Club of Lagos, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I must at the outset express my gratitude for the honor of this invitation to address this famous assembly, the gathering of the distinguished members of the Metropolitan Club of Lagos. In my youth, and this is not to suggest that in any way that I'm old, <laughs> I belong to a similar club like yours in Accra, the majority of whose membership subsequently went on to do great things in various sectors of national life in Ghana. Happily for me, I was the only one who went on to become president. <laughs> I congratulate the membership of the club for its many years of service to the growth and development of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In Alaji Olufemi Okulu's letter of invitation to me, he, an eminent jurist, senior advocate of Nigeria, outstanding public servant, and president of the club, indicated that members of the Metropolitan Club continue to be major contributors to the progress of Nigeria. Long may that tradition of the club flourish. And I'm amazed to receive a picture of myself when I have hair, <laughs> and the club's eminent founder, Sadetukumbu Ademola. I came here with several members of, in my delegation who, like me, are always happy to come to Nigeria, a country I describe as my second home. <laughs> Indeed, Ghana and Nigeria are like proverbial sisters siblings, 
And sometimes it is surprising to realize that we do not have a common border. We care about each other very much, and the rivalry between us can be found on the football field. A recent example being when we qualified for the World Cup at your expense. And in the kitchen, when we decide who makes the best jollof, you and I know the answer is obvious. As the Deputy High Commissioner said, Ghanaian jollof. In colonial times, there was a lot of interaction between the civilian and military intelligentsia and elites of our two countries, especially as many of them received their higher education in the same institutions in the common imperial center of Great Britain. This is a tradition we must, in the different circumstances of the 21st century, strive to maintain. On a more personal note, I recall the famous Lagosian lawyer of yesteryear, the late Ladipo Moore, who was the best friend of my father, the late president of the Second Republic of Ghana and former Chief Justice, Edward Akufu Adam. They met at the Inns of Court in London and became bosom friends. After they were called to the bar, they traveled by boat together back home to West Africa. The boat dropped my father off in Takradi and Uncle Ladi in Apapa. His sister, the late Kofo Moore, married Nigeria's historic first Chief Justice of the Federation, who coincidentally led the formation of this club, the late Seade Tukumbo Ademola. They became the parents of Boiga Ademola, a lifelong friend from my youth and a member of this club. Again, I have two beautiful, elegant daughters from Ile Ife, who are granddaughters of the late renowned lawyer, politician, Chief Red Mifani Kayode QC, and nieces of my controversial Eswa brother in law, the Honorable Femi Fani <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when I was elected, and I'm, I recognize that it takes a Ghanaian guest to introduce the concept of ladies into the vocabulary of this club. When I was elected by my peers as chairperson of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, I outlined five immediate challenges facing West Africa, whose resolution I indicated was going to be of prime concern for me. As fate would have it, one of them, the consolidation of democratic governance in our region, has been on the front burner of my tenure as ECOWAS chair, with most of the meetings convened during my time, having to deal with matters in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, which have each sadly experienced coup d'etats in the last two years. I want to use this opportunity to speak briefly into ALIA on why it should be in our collective interest in West Africa to ensure that democracy is the preferred mode of governance and why we should all say no to unconstitutional changes in governments. We've certainly come a long way but we should not take it for granted that everybody has accepted democracy as the preferred mode of governance. There are those who still hanker after authoritarian personal rule because they claim Africa is underdeveloped and democracy is cumbersome and we need to get things done in a hurry. There are those who seek shortcuts to office to exercise power without limits. And there are those who have no respect for the free choices of our sovereign peoples because they do not accord with their so-called ideological preferences. We still have some work to do 
to convince such people that we are all safer and better off under democracies. We should all continue to be guided by the famous dictum of the great British wartime leader, Winston Spencer Churchill, when he said, and I quote, democracy is the worst form of governance except for all the others, unquote. According to the African Center for Strategic Studies, 18 African leaders have either modified or eliminated constitutional term limits in the past two decades. In addition, another eight resisted efforts to institute term limits, bringing the number of countries lacking constitutional restraints on the exercise of executive power to 26. This represents almost exactly half of the number of countries on the continent. In, co in contrast, the same source notes that 21 countries upheld term limits and 15 now have them in their, constitu in their constitutions, like Nigeria and like Ghana. The average time office holders have been in power in the 21 countries that have respected term limits is four years. In most of the situations where incumbents have not respected term limits, they've argued that the basis for hanging on to power is in response to popular pressure by their people to remain in office, and that term limits have no meaning in poor and underdeveloped societies where uplifting citizens has to be the utmost priority. Others also believe that leaders should remain in office for as long as they continue winning elections. However, electoral processes that have been used to engender term limit extensions or removals in Africa have often been marred by allegations of widespread irregularities. Ruling parties that apply this route usually enjoy near total control of most, if not all, the levers of government and the electoral machinery. Consequently, many African peoples have paid a steep price for efforts by leaders to circumvent constitutional term limits. Upwards of 90% of the 26 countries that either lacked term limits or circumvented them have experienced various varying levels of civil unrest and political instability, including coup d'etats. The continent's democratic progress is threatened by such events. We have all witnessed directly the devastating effects the coup d'etats and attempted coups have had on the region. There have been at least three such recent occurrences in Mali, Guinea and Burkina Faso, and an unsuccessful attempt in Guinea-Bissau. A myriad of factors underpinning unconstitutional changes of government have been identified. Amongst them are deficiencies in governance, political greed, mismanagement of diversity, failure to seize opportunities, marginalization, human rights violations, unwillingness to accept electoral defeat, manipulation of constitutions, and their revision through unconstitutional means to serve personal narrow interests and so on. Even more worrying, the expression of social discontent by the citizenry against these factors, usually through peaceful protests, has often been met with varying degrees of repression co-option, violence, and further consolidation of the status quo. Is this the Africa we want? The reappearance of coups in Africa in all its forms and manifestations should be condemned by all, since it seriously undermines our collective bid to rid the continent of the menace of instability and unconstitutional changes in government. As currently defined by the frameworks enshrined in the Lumid Declaration, the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, 
another important regional and continental instrument. Unconstitutional regime changes retard the growth of countries. As much as the drivers are largely do domestic, the international dimension can also not be overlooked. Foreign involvement in fomenting unconstitutional changes, often in favor of repressive governments, foreign economic interests, and other would-be geopolitical benefits are also contributory factors. Some foreign entities regard coups in African countries as a means of enhancing, enhancing their regional ambitions. As such, they engage in all sorts of disinformation campaigns in a bid to disparage the authority of democratically elected governments and instigate opposition protests against incumbents. In implementing existing continental and regional instruments and protocols, defaulting member states are condemned and suspended from the activities of continental and regional bodies and individual coup makers are sanctioned. However, the reality is that these sanctions have not been applied uniformly. Whilst we are quick to sanction military coup leaders, civilians who achieve civil similar ends via the manipulation of constitutions to remain in power, for example, go without sanctions, although their actions are clearly prohibited in our legal instruments. This means that the existing frameworks need to be strengthened to capture such infractions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is crucial that we work together to change the African narrative, which has been characterized too often by a concentration on instability, disease, hunger, poverty, and illegal mass migration. We must help make Africa the place for investment, progress, and prosperity, and not from where our youth flee in the hope of accessing the mirage of better lives in Europe or the Americas. Our problem over the years, I suggest, has been leadership. The implementation of plans in ECOWAS, for example, has been left to well-meaning tenocrats technocrats and bureaucrats. However well-meaning they may be, our region cannot make the bold transformative changes it needs to make without effective political leadership. We need leadership that is focused on the region and not on individual countries. The European Union took off because essentially the political leadership of France and Germany decided to make it work. There can be little doubt that the common market of the European Union, grouping together the economies of 27 countries with a combined population of 477 million people with a, within a common custom zone and operating with a single currency, has, despite contemporary challenges, been extremely beneficial to the growth and prosperity of the European peoples. The European project has so far been an outstanding success. I am of the firm view that Ghana and Nigeria, the two largest economies in the region, with a great deal of political and historical synergy, must provide equivalent leadership. We must provide the vision and passion to translate the ECOWAS dream of creating a viable common market of 350 million people into reality, especially now that the African continental free trade area has been launched. We have the numbers, we have the economic muscle, and dare I say, we owe it to the region. Achieving regional integration and consolidating democratic governance should go hand in hand with the strengthening of the private sector. 
for the avoidance of doubt. And just in case there was anyone who was unaware of my personal beliefs and those of my party, the new patriotic party, I support and believe in business and in the private sector as the generator of wealth and jobs. As the experiences of the successful countries in Asia, Europe and elsewhere have shown, governments must help create an atmosphere for the private sector to thrive and create jobs and lead the socio-economic transformation of their societies. Government's business is to ensure that businesses are up and running and have access to the capital that will keep the wheels of industry and the economy moving. These are simple beliefs with profound implications. Governments have to assist this process by fashioning and implementing a comprehensive set of policies that will empower the private sector to achieve its goals. Appropriate fiscal, monetary, financial, energy, exchange rate, tariff, and non-tariff policies must be coordinated to enable African enterprises to be competitive and, where possible, achieve comparative advantage. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has revealed that no country can go it alone in trying to create wealth, progress, and prosperity for its people. Indeed, the difficulties occasioned by the pandemic, such as strong inflationary pressures, dramatically rising fuel prices, unprecedented volatility of stock markets, and tighter global financing conditions have been exacerbated even further by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the geopolitics of the Russia-Ukraine war. Our respective economies have been affected badly by these shocks with the ripple effects felt by all. If ever, there was a time to hasten the process of integration in West Africa and Africa. Now is the time, the result of which will transform dramatically and positively the economic prospects of the West African and African peoples. We all fell together and looked into the abyss together. Even as we closed our borders and shut airports, the reality dawned on all of us that we had to rely on each other to be able to get out of the trouble we were in. We have all gone down together. We should all rise together. In particular, In particular for us in West Africa, it has given us a good sense of how important it is to strengthen our unity and solidarity and has intensified in us the motivation, if any was needed, to be self-reliant. By 2050, the population of our continent will be 2.5 billion people, up from the 1.2 billion of today. It will mean that one in four persons on the planet will be an Africa. The prospects for Africa's greatness, if we act responsibly now, are limitless. I'm an incurable optimist and believe in our capacity to reach the goals of progress and prosperity. And in doing so, I'm comforted by the words of the late great Marcus Garvey, when he said, and I quote, the black skin is not a badge of shame, but rather a glorious symbol of national greatness, unquote. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have to look far back into history to see that a stable period of constitutional government and intelligent management of the economy can lead to prosperity. I believe in West Africa's immense potential for greatness. I believe the stable democracies in West Africa can help in unleash the energies of the West African people to inspire the successful transformation of the region and the continent. This can be West Africa's, indeed, Africa's century. We can claim it if we believe in ourselves 
and in our people. I thank you once again for the invitation to be in your midst to enjoy this celebrated traditional Tuesday luncheon of the club. And I'm confident that the best days and indeed the best years of the Metropolitan Club lie ahead. 